does medieval Islamic law prescribe the death penalty for uh, uh, extramarital sex? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. It does uh, uh, prescribe the death penalty for extramarital, not premarital. Adultery, basically. Yes, it does. But once again, how often was this law actually applied even in medieval times? Was this the norm or was this a type of scare tactic so that people don't uh, actually commit adultery? Even according to our own medieval scholars, this law is actually meant more as something in the books to terrify you rather than to actually implement. And it is very rare, even in medieval Islam, to, 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 to come across these occurrences. Um, should they be updated and, and, and modernized? Again, that's an ongoing discussion. And that's one of the main sources of, of intra-Muslim dialogue. We are debating amongst ourselves. Um, you know, I am sure many Jews and many Christians understand this. The texts say things that are somewhat problematic at times. You, all religious people know what I'm talking about here, right? The texts have some laws that are somewhat bizarre. And this is all texts. Need I quote you Levit Le Leviticus and Deuteronomy and, and whatnot? I mean, you know, you understand my point here. So Muslims do need to have that dialogue and, and they are having it. But the claim that somehow this is representative of mainstream or even worse, that this is somehow relevant to us American Muslims. I mean, that's simply preposterous. What has this act got to do with us here? I understand that at a theoretical level, it's nice to discuss, let, let, let academics come, let clerics come, let's discuss this out. But I, as a national American cleric, when I go to sleep at night, it's not my primary concern. What do I do with the text about, 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 uh, time. I'm a preacher who gives khutbas and mawa'il. I'm a public lecturer who addresses large audiences in Muslim conferences and conventions, you know, 100,000 people here, 50,000, 10,000 here, you know, and that's a different uh, style. I'm a person who, on a personal level, gives fatwas and durus and answers Islamic questions one-on-one. -on -one. So I give the answer that the person needs. I also teach very advanced classes in Aqid and Ulum al-Quran, dare I say, cutting-edge classes at the Islamic Seminary of America, and ask any of my students that have taken that class. And I also address hostile crowds of non-Muslims. Uh, multiple times I've been invited by communities, especially during the ISIS crisis, uh, to address non-Muslims. And I have made a promise to myself, this is my promise, that whatever I say, it should be factually correct. I have to answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The problem mm -hmm. comes when these <laughs> fledgling sophomores, I call them neophytes, but then my other group makes fun of me, they Google the word, they look it up, and then they start using it as a, as a slur on their site. Call them what you will, complete novices for the thought is They don't understand that what you say is not going to be the same on the audience depending on when and how you are saying it. When you teach advanced classes is not the same as when you give a fatwa. When you preach a lecture in the khutbah is not the same as when you address 50,000 people in a convention. When you speak to a non-Muslim academic audience is not the same as when you speak to a non-Muslim hostile generic general public audience. And so this clip that they have of me is me being invited to a community that was going through a lot of issues. Uh, the first time they had a public Muslim speaker, uh, it's outside of, I think, Massachusetts, Boston somewhere. And Alhamdulillah, you know, the city officials came if not, I forgot, was it the mayor or the deputy of the mayor? And it was a lot of people and ISIS is going on. They're taking the Yazidi slaves going on this and that. Alhamdulillah, I gave a very good talk and they really liked it. And then it was an open q and I said, any questions you want, the more problematic, the better it is. And so these questions are coming in from a hostile, general public, non-Muslim audience. Jay, now, we understand therefore that this is not an advanced class. It's not aqidah, it's not teaching. It's basically addressing non-Muslims. To say that a text is problematic, mushkin, is not something that is strange to any student of knowledge. In fact, Al-Tahawi has sharh mushkil al-athar, yani talking about a hadith that are problematic. Ibn Fawraq has mushkil al-hadith, the problematic hadith. Ibn Hajar, when he talks about the hadith of Adam being 60 cubits tall, and then he goes, but modern archaeology doesn't have any indication, wa mushkil, and this is problematic. And then he goes, I don't have an answer to this. No. Any advanced student of knowledge knows that this term in and of itself is not problematic. It is factually correct to point out, and 
I'm sorry to be a little bit it, it, it harsh here, but anybody with the two digit IQ would understand that it is factually correct to say these texts are problematic vis-a-vis -vis the culture and the uh, norms that we, we, that we follow. They are problematic. Just like Ibn Hajar says, the, the hadith of 60 cubits is mushkil in light of archaeology. He's not billah, yani, dismissing the hadith. He's simply pointing out a factual statement that it is a problem. The Quran says, hunna. This is a verse that is problematic for our culture. Is that something wrong with that? Not at all. You are. Can, I, can is, I come back and uh, can, I have, can I play devil's advocate here a little bit? Because um, I know what a lot of people will be kind of saying here. Um, and so to represent, obviously, the, the way of yeah. criticism. The, the, I think a lot of people will say, oh, all of the examples that you've given, um, the, pre, the, the mushkil has been problematized in correspondence with, say, for example, mantiq, or logic, or, or hadith, which is a science, it's Islamic in its essence, like from a sanity perspective. But if, you, if you, someone could argue that, well, if you're going to say it's mushkil from the perspective of our culture, so it comes across as capitulatory. So, so why should we absorb that culture in the first place in order that we may problematize? Yeah, the, Muhammad, this is the conversation the that should take. Yeah, Muhammad, this is the conversation that needs to take place with oh. our students. And we begin yes. with this and we push it forward. Listen to my, I'm sure you have, listen to the talk I gave on the LGBT issue a few months ago when I went over seven yes. points. The first point of them was exactly what you just said. But ya akhi, you know this as a da'i. I'm speaking to a group that are not even academics, they're awam, right? And the point right now is to, these people, many of them think Islam is, gonna, is out to kill us. They're going to just, they're demonizing the faith. The goal in this audience is not to convince them of the wisdom of the hudud. That's not the time and place to do that. The goal right now is to explain to them, look guys, you know, your text, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, also has issues that you understand, but you're still believing Christians, okay? Now again- yeah, As for me, like, uh, I, I'll be honest, as, like when, when I first heard of, my, my initial reaction to it is Hosn al I understood like the situation for like, I get it, like, um, uh, Dr. Yasser, he means, I, I understood that. And I, the first thing I thought about was mushkil from a grammatical perspective, the ayat. Like some of the, some of the mufassirun um, uh, and some of the pinohat, they used to use that language. It's problem from a, a grammatical perspective. Exactly how I'm using it, bro. Like you're saying, yeah. in, in, in early Islam, they problematized the ayat and a hadith of sifat because of mantiq. And they said, these are mushkil. Okay, yeah. in our times, nobody cares about mantiq. They care about human values. They care about sexuality. They care about gender. They care about LGBT. And yeah. so it is factually correct to state that vis-a-vis -vis what we believe to be correct, you guys, I mean, not me, obviously, but you guys believe to be correct. Yeah. Okay, this is an issue. We have to discuss it. And of course, it's not the time and place to go into every single discussion. Let me give you a, a, a simple example here. And again, to illustrate that these brothers that dramatize this, Honestly, some of them, it is very clear to me, and we have Husnadan of most, but some of them, it is very clear that they're obsessed with refuting and they're not even qualified to refute. They're not even qualified to understand English, much less usul. They haven't spent years giving da'wah. Let me give you a scenario. Imagine if somebody said, a da'i, a famous da'i. Imagine if somebody said in a platform, you know, maybe Christianity is correct. I'll hand it to you that hypothetically, theoretically, maybe Christianity is correct in which case Islam is going to be wrong. But then maybe the opposite is true as well, in which case Islam is true and Christianity is wrong. Can you agree to that possibility? Now, I am 100% certain if I said something like that, I mean, these guys would have a, <laughs> Manhaj police would explode from ecstasy from if they found that type of video, video, uh, you know, a clip from me. Perillianism, kufr, wahdat al adyan. But subhanAllah, I'm actually paraphrasing the Quran itself. Yeah. This is in the Quran. Either I'm right or you're right. One of the two of us is ala hudan and the other is in upon dalal mubin. Allah is clear. I think I think it is clear. You've made your position very clear. I think now it's it's only fair for someone to conclude that you it was it was very contextual. You, you it was the height of ISIS situation. You didn't know you were being filmed. You, you're even saying that. No, but that's, don't bring that. Not being filmed is not the point. I stand by what I yeah, said. Yeah. And I thank Allah that, yeah. that I didn't fall into an error because they would have. But, but you did that say that you would reconsider the phraseology. That, the so yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. The phrasing, because, you know, you, you put on the spot, man. You're not, it's not a prepared yeah, yeah. 
lecture notes. You know, you're like, you're asked point blank. And by the way, the videos online, I encourage all of you to listen to all of the questions. All of them were very difficult questions. You know, ISIS, slavery, Yazidi girls, this and that. I mean, you know, uh, it's a very difficult time and place. And there are yeah. people that have never heard of Islam except through Fox News. I'm the first person that they're coming to. And these are people of the city, the town hall, whatnot. Yeah, I chose what I chose. And honestly, mm -hmm. I'll be honest, I think I would have said a similar sentiment if I were to have gone back, given what I know of that situation. Maybe a few yeah. words here and there are different. But a few words here and there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, a few words here and there could make a big difference. Okay, now... On And the surah began straight immediately. Suratun anzannaha. A surah we have revealed and its laws we have made obligatory and we have made it very crystal clear for you, the verses, so that you can pay heed, so that you can understand. And then immediately the punishment comes that those who fornicate, men and women, lash them 100 times. And obviously this is done in the lands of the Sharia. Ah. You know, all of the penal codes of Islam, all of the codes that pertain to the crimes against society, these types of punishments, they are done obviously in courts of law that are judged by Islamic laws in Islamic lands. Obviously, no scholar ever says that these types of things are done by individuals ad hoc. That's not the way that uh, this happens. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states that a fornicator should only marry a similar type of person or even an idolater. And then Allah says, but of course you cannot marry an idolater. And our scholars have ruled or have understood from this that this isn't a legal ruling that if somebody fornicates, they can only marry somebody who is also fornicator, but rather Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is linking the act of fornication with something that everybody should find disgusting and that is, and that is uh, the issue of worshiping false gods. And so Allah Azza wa is saying, just like you wouldn't want to marry somebody who's worshiping another God, so too, you would not want to marry somebody who uh, is continuously doing this sin. Now, obviously, by the way, if a person has done such a sin in the past and has repented, they should conceal their past lives and it is permissible for them to marry um, anyone uh, that is allowed to marry. The next section, verses 4 to 10, it deals with the rules of accusing people of fornication. And Allah Azza wa is stating that just like fornication is a sin, so too it is a sin to accuse somebody of fornication without evidence. And th what is the evidence? Four eyewitnesses to the actual act. And this shows that the bar of being punished for this crime is very high, unreasonably high, to be honest. In Islamic history, it has never happened that four people have witnessed such a crime and somebody has been punished in an Islamic land. And then Allah says in verse 13, if you do not have four witnesses and you make this accusation, you will be considered a liar in the eyes of Allah, subhanAllah. If three people saw such a deed and this is a fornication, they are told to be quiet about it and do not testify. Only if four people saw and they go to the court and whatnot, then it is going to be uh, punished. And from all of this, we see very clearly, and I've said this in Surah Al-Ma'idah as well, the psychology of Islamic punishments is very clear. Yes, they are harsh. There is no need to sugarcoat, but they are meant as a deterrent. They are rarely applied, even historically. And in fact, this, this, uh, this section is also a proof for this. The bar to be punished is so high. And then also in verse number two uh, of the surah, what does Allah say? وَلْيَشْهَدْ عَذَابَهُمَا طَائِفَةٌ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Let a group of people witness the punishment. The goal here is to deter others from committing such a crime. Therefore, the punishment is indeed very, very harsh. But that one harshness will translate into untold baraka and blessings for the entire community. And the goal, of course, is very clear. And that is to protect the family and to protect the honor of the family, especially the honor of women. Now, obviously, that uh, issue of witnesses, there has to be a concession if it is between a husband and wife because if uh, infidelity happens, you cannot expect the husband to go get four witnesses, for example. So an exception is made. And this is the famous verses of li'an or mutual cursing. And the details are in uh, the section over here that in lieu of four witnesses, if the husband has seen this act, then the, 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 the spouse can then mention the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and give a qasam 
four times using the name of Allah that he is telling the truth, and the fifth time that in case he is lying, he will invoke the curse of God on himself. A'udhu billah, a'udhu billah. And the lady in her defense, she also has the right to say four times that I am truthful and he is lying, and the fifth time she will say that uh, Allah's anger be upon her if uh, uh, she is the one that's lying in this case. And uh, this, these are the famous verses of Li'an, of mutual uh, cursing, and you can look at the books of Fiqh and the books of Sirah to find more details on this verse. Then after this follows a series of verses that deal with the slander of our mother Aisha. This also then leads us to perhaps the most contentious and controversial issue uh, of this issue of Islamic law. And that is we're always asked it, okay, what is the penalty? What is the verdict on those who practice this um, deed? And as we know in Islamic law, Societies that base their law on the Sharia, societies that are judging by the Sharia, they do have punishments for all types of moral indecencies and sexual infractions. However, all of these have a very high bar to prove. And if that bar is crossed, if it is proven, then indeed there are extremely harsh deterrents that are meant to scare people away. They are meant so that people don't act upon them. The crime of extramarital intercourse, for example, extramarital intercourse, for example, the crime of extramarital intercourse in classical Islamic law carries the death penalty. However, in actual Islamic history, it was hardly ever enacted as a crime. The books mention that yes, extramarital affairs have this punishment. But in actual history, Ibn Taymiyyah and others point out, never in Islamic history was somebody actually executed for an extramarital affair because of a crime, only because of a confession. Because the bar to be proven is so high, four witnesses looking at the act exactly, it is almost impossible, if not impossible, to actually meet. So we should not sensationalize the textbooks that mention classical punishments. We need to understand the wisdom of mentioning those punishments is to be a deterrent. They are rarely acted upon even in utopic Islamic ideals. They're rarely implemented even in the history of Islam. It's there. It's meant to frighten. It's meant that you don't do it. But historically speaking, they were rarely done. And there is no denying that as Ibn al-Qayyim mentioned in his book, Adda'u wa dawa that the penalty for uh, sodomy, some ulama said, it is worse than that, the punishment for extramarital affairs. Some said it is the same as extramarital affairs. And some said it is lesser than extramarital affairs. This is the famous Hanafi position where they said that it is actually not even the execution is going to be done. So we have a diversity. And you can look up a really good article by Dr. Jonathan Brown. Uh, if you can uh, find it online, it's called the Sharia, homosexual sexuality and safeguarding each other's rights. The Sharia, homosexuality and safeguarding each other's rights in a pluralistic society. He goes over the evidences and the positions of this. So there is no question that the punishment for this is mentioned in our classical books. That's the second point. This leads us to our third point.